what might the NCC, the neural correlate of consciousness, be like? Assuming that it is, that it's an emergent uh, neuroscientific process. And let me say straight away that we don't know what it's like. I just have to enumerate some of the, the, the possibilities. Well, we do know, as I said before, that uh, consciousness is not likely to be in a single place. It's, uh, it's not likely to be in multiple places. And, and the strongest evidence for that probably, well, the, the two bits of evidence are from brain damage and also, more recently, from, from scans, scans of, of people. So it's not going to be in a single cortical area or something like that. Now, what is less clear is whether it involves special types of neurons or special types of synapses on the one hand, or whether it can be all over the place, and that any neuron in the brain at one time or another can be an essential ingredient of the NCC. And that we, don't, we really don't know. Uh, the, the, the point of view that Christoph and I have taken is that uh, well, because a, uh, a lot of people say, well, it's global, and you can't pin it down to particular types of neurons. We say, let's not assume that. Let's keep an eye open for the possibility that it's special types of neurons, not just one type, I don't think that, but special types of neurons, which, of course, can be in a lot of different places, special types of pyramidal cells or special types of synapses, whatever. The next thing we have to ask is, uh, is the NCC associated with special types of firing? For example, some neurons fire in bursts. And without going into it, there are advantages of firing in bursts because some synapses, at any rate, are not terribly reliable and they may, may not work on the first spike that comes down. But the general rule seems to be if you have two spikes in succession, at least well, one of them will always work. The other one, which is a much debated subject, is whether it depends on the correlated firing of neurons, not just a set of neurons firing away, but firing with the spikes arriving with a high degree of co correlation. And, and, and one form of that is if you, you had them firing in some sort of rhythm, the so-called gamma or 40 hertz ry rhythm and so on. And this leads us to a problem which is essentially what, a, a central one for understanding the brain and not just consciousness. Is what matters, and this, of course, well, the answer will depend probably on the different activities you're considering, is what matters the average firing rate of a neuron, which is what it's traditionally taken to be, although people are a little bit vague over what time you should take the average, or at the other extreme, does it depend on the exact timing of the axonal spikes? Which we know, now, we know that both of those are true in certain circumstances. What we don't know is, is what it does, wh which of those methods or what combination are used in different places. And, of course, we want to know which ones are particularly important for the NCC. And uh, this is a matter of uh, acute speculation between Christopher and myself at the moment, and I'm not going to try and sketch the answers because they're too preliminary, but just to say it's an important problem. The other thing, which I think is equally important, is not, it is not necessarily a set of neurons, but it is possibly a, a loops, re-entrant re -entrant pathways, as Edelman has called them, uh, which are important. And this is a highly attractive idea, although it's not easy to study. Unfortunately, the re-entrant pathways all over the brain, all over the cortex, between the cortex and, and, and the thalamus, and everywhere you look, it's unusual not to find loops of one sort or another. The key question is which loops, if they are important matter, and how do they interact? Are there some that are essential? Is, is it, perhaps, perhaps you have to have, there are five important loops, and perhaps you have to have a combination of three of them. You can enumerate all sorts of possibilities. The answer is that we don't know. But these are the things that we have to keep an eye open for. Now, what other characteristics are there? Well, one, one thing which, again, and this is all guesswork, one thing that you might think is that the activity must reach above a certain threshold. Now, remember, we've just, just, I've just said how vague we are as to what we mean by activity, but let's leave that aside for the moment. And, but it seems more than likely that you do have to, to reach consciousness. The activity of sets of neurons, whatever that may be, have to reach above a certain threshold and maintain and maintain, be above that threshold for a certain amount of time. 
And if you have what very transient conscious experiences, or what's called fringe consciousness and so on, of course that may be a rather short time. Another time it may, it may be, be longer. And uh, uh, for weak signals that may involve some form of integration. Now how long do you have to do it? <laughs> well, it certainly can't be too short. Uh, way back in the last century, James, uh, William James Cr uh, quoted a, uh, 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 a Frenchman who said he would endure any pain if it only lasted, I've forgotten what he said, for a millisecond, and, the, and if, if there was no recollection of it afterwards. So it's virtually certain that for consciousness something has to last, and the sort of time we're talking about is a minimum of 200, one or 200 milliseconds, but of course we don't know the time. And uh, whether, so that is often called iconic memory, and of course is studied by psychologists. Now whether what is called working memory, which is what you use when you remember a telephone number, and can last for a somewhat longer time, several seconds or something or other, that's unclear. My own belief is that you could probably have deficits in work in memory and still be conscious, so of course you'd be limited, but you'd be very much limited because of that. Another general thing that you might say is, and this has been put forward especially by Bernie Bass, is that when the, you have neurons expressing the NCC, they probably want to send the inf information fairly widely in the brain. Unfortunately, that doesn't actually help, help you as to know exactly what and where, but it's something probably to, to be look out for. And here we have to make what is probably an important distinction, that when you have the NCC, what we imagine is there will be certain activities which actually carries the content of the MCC. But of course that will be sent elsewhere and activate all sorts of things. That will be very relevant when you have to ask what is the meaning of what you see. When you see something, you obviously arouse in your brain a lot of associations. They may not actually cause the, uh, the neurons as, uh, which, are, uh, uh, which are related to those associations to fire, but you may what's called prime them. You may give them some activity, for example. And this is one of the difficulties when you watch scans of people being conscious. You don't know which are the, what are the primary, uh, uh, which activity is the primary one of consciousness and what is the secondary one which is associated for it. Naturally, you want to understand it all. But the one we're trying to focus on is what is the neurons which express the primary content in the first place. And of course it may be that's not a, not a correct theoretical analysis. We may have to change our views, but that's the... Um, the way we do it at the moment. And, and we shall certainly have to do it when we come to the problem of meaning. Now by meaning, I don't mean meaning in terms of words. I mean, I, I put it in the, in, the, in the way that John Searle, the philosopher, has put it to me. Here you have these neurons in a part of the brain, sets of neurons, in more than one place incidentally, which respond, broadly speaking, to faces. But how does the rest of the brain know that that corris that's corresponds to a face? And that really is an interesting question. Because you're not aware of the, as he, many philosophers point out, you're not aware of the firing of the neurons as such. You're aware of the face. It's sometimes described as being transparent, what you're aware of, and so on. So we certainly have, have to think about that. Now there is another way of thinking about the problem, which I think is on the right lines, but has to be used with some caution. And that is it may be, and we, certainly Christoph and I do think of this from time to time, that you can think of the brain activity in the regions, in the realms we're talking about, as falling into two broad classes. One is what you might call the computations, that is, in other word, language, but we don't want to make it sound too much like, like a, 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 a computer. One is the activities which lead up to consciousness, and the other is the ones which are, are express the results. Now, of course, we're familiar with this in a computer. A lot of what, all that leads up to it goes on inside, and what the results are are usually expressed on the screen in front of you. But don't press that too far, and, uh, or you'll find yourself asking who's looking at the screen, and a few little difficulties like that, for example. So, uh, you also have to realize that the, 
And unlike a computer screen, <laughs> which will sit, with the, will sit there happily for, for as long, well, as long as uh, before it sw switches over to um, uh, giving those screen-saving things, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the results, as it were, what you see is changing fairly rapidly with time. You, you, it, is, it isn't necessarily just a series of snapshots, but certainly it ch it's changing all the time. Now, when Christoph and I started, we hoped that we could get useful clues, and I'm sure we can, but we were perhaps over-optimistic, from visual psychology. And let me be, I'm going to be very brief in this section. One of the things which we uh, ought to look into more and are in the process of looking into, and therefore I won't say very much about it because we haven't got what you might call our mature conclusions on it, is the effect of timing. It's well known that if you have a flash, flash a, 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 a colored patch, um, which is, we say red, and then a colored patch shortly after that, uh, which is green, you don't see, if you do it quickly enough, I won't go into all the details, you don't see red and then green, you see yellow. And moreover, depending on the relative timing, the shade of what you see is answered. The next thing that uh, we looked, we, we, um, we thought we ought to pay attention to was attention itself. And because it's quite clear, <laughs> it's very easy to show that unless you, that if you attend to something, you, could, you, you perceive it more rapidly and more accurately than if you don't. Now, I didn't have a demonstration of this, because, but there, I don't know if some of you may have seen it. You, you flash on the screen a visual scene, like the one, say, in front of you, some, some everyday screen, and then uh, you, you flash it, or you show it for a time, a short time, brief time, then there's a blank, and you show it again, and then there's a blank, and you show it again, but in fact, every other one is slightly different. There's a change. In one case, there were two people sitting at a table, and there were trees and things on the table. And I could see no difference between these two until I suddenly spotted that the line of, of the ocean in the background was at this level in one of the pictures and this level in the other one. As soon as I attended to that, I saw it every time. So there's no doubt that consciousness is enrich enriched by attention. But there's considerable controversy, and I won't go into it, as to how essential attention is. And attention is a very uh, complex subject. There are people uh, at UCSD who know much more about it than, than I do. You can have what is roughly called bottom-up attention. There was a loud bang over there, for example. You'd all look around there immediately. It would be, it's called a bottom-up one. And then there's a top-down when you want to attend to something you deliberately attend. The, the general way to look at attention, I think, is to realize that those computations we talked about almost always involve competitive processes. When the visual input comes in, there are various ways which can be interpreted. It has to be segmented, all sorts of other things have to happen. There are alternative ways of dealing with it, and there is an unconscious competition between those two. This is the general way of thinking about how we see things. And what attention does essentially is, to, at least I think so, and at least I'm following Bob Desmond and colleague, is to bias that competition. It actually biases in one way or another. And this means that the, the biasing can probably take place at a lot of different processes and that attention is not a simple mechanism. It may have some characteristics in common, but it's probably in many parts of the brain. In short, it hasn't really helped us at this stage, although we have to keep uh, an, an eye on it. Well, and I also should say the one thing we also do is to, is to keep an eye on ideas uh, from mathematically based but oversimplified models, because there are a lot of that, and I would be embarrassed to say much in the presence of, of Terry Stanowski about this, but certainly one of the ideas which we mentioned that are what's called coarse coding, which, uh, although you could have got it perhaps from knowing how color is co co coded in the, in the visual system, has really come out of that. And I think general ideas of that can be of great use, but I won't dwell, dwell on, on the, that, those sorts of ideas. Well, now, now let's come to the, the second part of what I want to say, which is the, the different classes of possible experiments that you might do to get at the NCC. In other words, 
to try to distinguish conscious processes from non-conscious processes. Now, at this stage, we're only going to go through them in outline. And in the, in the latter part of the lecture, I'll go through some examples in detail. Now, most of them that we are interested are based on the visual, of the input, and in this case, the visual input, being sharply different from the associated percept. And the other thing is, we prefer ones which you can study, also study in a monkey, because we want to get down not to the general activity of the brain, which you can get out of brain scans in humans, but in addition to the detailed activity at the level of the individual neurons and groups of neurons. And I'll just list them briefly and then we'll give some examples lately. Well, one of them is when you have a bistable percept. Now, I didn't put it on, uh, one of them is a neck a cube, but it's not always easy to show with people at the flank. But it's a drawing of a cube, many of you have seen it. It's a drawing of a cube, just the, the outlines of, of a cube. And when you look at it, you look at it, a certain, it looks at a certain way, you keep on looking at it, it switches it and you see it from a different way. Another one which you may be more familiar with is a vase. It looks like a vase, but then it, it can look like the profile of, of, of two people, for example. So those are what's called bistable ones, and the one I'm going to talk about later is called binocular rivalry, when you put in different signals into the two eyes and you see first one and then the other. In addition to that, of course, and this is really a what somewhat unexplored field, there are many illusions. Although I think it's important to have strong, well-characterized illusions and ones that, again, that you study on a monkey. And one of those is what is called the motion after effect, which we know to some of you is the waterfall effect. If you, uh, if you happen to be watching a waterfall or a flow of water and you look at it for a time, the longer you look, the stronger the effect, by the way. You look at it for a time, let's say half a minute. You don't have to just gaze. You can just look at it like this sort of thing. And then you move your eyes to one side at the rocks, and the rocks briefly appear to go upwards. And th this has been known uh, for a long time, certainly uh, since the last century. There are other things which, which are useful to study. It's well known in people that if you have damage to this part, the parietal part of the brain, especially on the right-hand side, and let me just talk about the right-hand side for the moment and not doubt about the, what happens with both sides, you can get what is called neglect or extinction. Uh, a typical case happened to an artist, for example, who had damage here, and, uh, and he started to draw pictures of himself, and he, only, he neglected that side of his I have to look at it this way. This side of his face, he only drew this side of his face. And as he got better, he drew more and more of it. And this is a complicated subject because you, you don't, it isn't not just what, what's on the left, it can be the left side of objects and so on. But the fact is, uh, and it does depend in some cases, without going into the terminology, or whether there's two objects there that you're, we're looking at. And if, if there are, you often look at this one and don't see this one. So in other words, you're not conscious of it. So that's an important field of study, but I won't have any, any much more to say about that. Another obvious way, which for technical reasons hasn't been done, or has hardly been done, is to use anesthetics. If you have a, a reasonable d degree of depth of anesthesia, most people would consider they were unconscious. And the same would naturally be true of animals. What you would like to be able to do, therefore, is to study that. And the difficulty, the difficulty has been in, in doing it in a monkey is a technical one. What you would like to do is to be able to uh, have for a monkey study the same neuron with the same visual input, A, when the monkey is awake, and B, when it's under an anesthetic. The technical problem is that it's difficult to hold, as they say, in the alert animal or neuron long enough, and therefore nobody has done this uh, effectively as far as I know, or I think David Hubel did something a very long time ago, uh, but nobody's done this. It needs act quick acting anesthetics and such experiments are now, now being planned. Another example would be the fading of visual images. It's well known that if you, if you, if you fix, let's talk about one eye for the moment, if you fix 
the visual image. See, normally your eye makes small move, your memory your eyes is moving and it's making small movements which you're not hardly aware of and so on. But it was, originally was pioneered by a Russian called Yabas who fixed something actually on the retina so that it, it, uh, even when, you, when your eye moved at all, the image didn't change on the retina. And after the time is now a matter of controversy, but let's say a second, uh, about a second or so, the image completely f fades. If you then move it a little bit, which he did, <laughs> he had a little capillary with ink in it, and you couldn't see it faded, and then he moved the ink, and then you could see it. Now, there is evidence, preliminary, there was evidence actually done by Hebb, for those who are interested, years ago, suggesting that isn't just in the retina, it's a central process, not everything fades at the same time, and that would be another thing that you, you could study. Now, the, the other one, which is I just touched on briefly before, is the use of what I call zombie systems. That is to say, where you have a visual input and an appropriate motor output, uh, but you're not conscious of it. And uh, one of those is, is, is well known, and most of you will have heard of it, and certainly people who are neuroscientists, is known as blindsight. That pa patients have damage to uh, the first visual area, um, deny that they can see anything, they're asked to show whether a spot is moved, light is moving this way or this way or whatever it may be and uh, if it's not very salient, if it's moving too slowly or it's too dim then uh, they say well I can't see it of course but you persuade them to guess, they guess a chance but there comes a level essentially where they still say they can't see it but essentially they're guessing above chance and that is known as blindsight. And we mentioned another case of a zombie system in the previous lecture of the lady who had carbon monoxide poisoning, who you remember could not see shape or orientation, but could post an, a, a letter into a tilted slit in the right way. So there again, uh, these, these are the type of things, things you can do. So I think that gives you a glimpse of the range of experiments that could be done. But the plain fact is, only a few of them are being done, and now I want to talk about the ones, some of the ones which uh, have been done. Now let us take the case of binocular rivalry. Um, the person who actually uh, started work on this was John Allman, but the person uh, who essentially uh, taken it up and done it very systematically is, is Nikos Logothetis, uh, this Greek colleague of ours who now works at a Max Planck Institute in, in Tübingen. And when he was at MIT, he, um, I won't give the name of all the co-authors, uh, he, he worked on the so-called motion area, MT, and basically what you do in that case is you put a set of fringes going, um, let's say, upwards into one eye and going this way in the other, and what you see is, is not a mixture, although you may see that very transiently, but you see first that and then you see that. And then you do this on a monkey, you show that what's called the psychophysics is the same, so that you have reason to believe that the monkey is seeing it in the same way, the times at which it's alter alternated and not a Poisson distribution with another distribution and all that sort of stuff and so on. And of course it isn't always this way and this way, you find which, in which direction the neuron is interested in, and if it's interested in direction this way, then you do this in one eye and this in the other. And what you find then is that uh, a, a fraction of the neurons, see, it depends on how you do it, but let's say a third, that sort of number, do indeed uh, follow the percept, but most of them don't. In other words, there's a lot of unconscious processing. They're following the input. Remember, apart from the fact it's moving, the input is not changing. It's the percept that's changing, remember, and so on. And then paradoxically, Half the ones that followed the percept followed it the wrong way round. They were the opposite way you predict. So that was a bit funny, and we don't all understand that. His second series of experiments were done uh, on the borderline between the first and the second area, V1, V2, and there he did get uh, some cells following the percept, but much, much fewer. He also looked at, at area v, uh, V4, the one which is uh, concerned with shape and color, although uh, this is uh, exactly what V4 does in humans and monkeys is a matter of controversy. But I'm going to talk about the ones which are at the 
much uh, uh, higher up in the hierarchy in the so-called infratemporal region with which he, he did with, uh, with, with Scheinberg and published in 97. Now in this, he, let me say the protocols for those you're interested in, in each of these experiments were slightly different. And the protocol in this experiment was what's called flash suppression. If you, if you show something like this into one eye, and then you show something in the other eye, you flash it in, it almost always suppresses what it is. So that's, he used that particular technique, although he, ch he checked that it, that wasn't uh, uh, making an essential difference. And the first slide that I have, and uh, we may need the lights down for that, is uh, some of their, their results. Now, what he did, as you'll see, he uh, was uh, putting the face of, of a monkey was one of the signals, and this sunrise one was, was the other one. And uh, you, what you'll see, the convention is, look at this, this, uh, uh, this bit up here, is this would be the, the one eye, the left eye, and this the right eye. And then, there's a, uh, so there's nothing coming in at this stage. And then, as it were, he just shows the sunburst pattern and the neuron is not interested in the sunburst pattern. There will be other neurons in other parts of infratemporal which would be interested in the sunburst pattern, but on the contrary, when he did the same thing again, he went from nothing at all to just in no rivalry yet, just the face of a monkey. This is the neuron, this is what the neuron found in different trials, and this is the average of them, and you can see it got very excited. We're doing practically nothing here, and look at all this activity here. We're not going to worry too much about the exact time course at the moment, and so on. Okay, now we'll go to the beginning of the uh, binocular rivalry. First of all, you show a face in, into the right eye, and then you flash the sunburst pattern in the left eye. Well, when you show the face, notice there's a lot of activity. But as soon as you show the sunburst, and of course the monkey is signaling what he's seeing, you see, so that you've got some check on what he's seeing, notice that essentially what you'd predict is that he wouldn't see the face anymore, and notice that the signal goes right down to very little. Now look at it here in reverse. You show, start off showing the sunburst pattern, the cell isn't interested, and so on. You then flash the face in the other eye, and you get a lot of activity. Now the striking thing about this is that when you're in the intratemporal regions, which these results are, loosely speaking, I'm not saying precisely where they are, that uh, the majority of the, of the neurons, 90 to 95% show this type of behavior, though not all of them show this all or none behavior. Curiously enough, some of the neurons show the all or none beha behavior, and naturally <laughs> we're very interested for Nikos to discover which neurons those are. He thinks he knows what they are, but I'm not going to tell you the answer because he doesn't want to publish it until he's had got more results. But anyway, here you have a real demonstration of how you can see something which corresponds to what you're perceiving and not what is merely coming into your eyes. And the further you go up the hierarchy, the visual hierarchy, the, it appears the stronger you get. Now remember, that if you go to the front of the brain, which we'll discuss a little bit later, there are face neurons there. And that has not yet been discovered, but he's tooling up to do that. And also tooling up to do uh, fMRI on monkeys, by the way. Now, since he'd published these works, uh, t uh, two, two groups, uh, Eric Luber and his colleagues on the one hand, and Nancy Canwish and, and, and a colleague on the other hand, have, have studied this. I'm not going to go this in, in details, have studied this uh, using fMRI on humans, which means you can see activity all over the brain. Remember, he was just looking in one particular place, but you can see an activity all over the brain, and I won't go into the details except to say that you not only see the activity where you expect it to be in these areas, that you remember is in the ventral stream, but you also see it in the parietal regions and the prefrontal regions. and and. Uh, uh, Luma, in particular, has done it, but people say when you're up near the prefrontal regions, you're, in the, you're getting near the, the parts of the brain which control the motor output, that the monkey signals is doing something. So he's done the experiments where the monkey doesn't signal something, and he still get, gets that. He does it by a special technique, uh, correlating signals and fMRI, which I won't get into. 
But there is both, in both cases, you get fairly excellent co co correlations. So naturally, we're very keen for these to be, re first of all, for the fMR re results to be repeated on a monkey, and then on the same monkey, and this is what the, uh, the Nikos is going to do, to go in and look with multiple electrodes in different areas so we can see the behavior of the individual neurons. And this is oncoming prog program. Uh, it, all these things, I may say, are technically extremely difficult. If you want to get good resolution of an fMRI on a monkey, you have to use a, a 4.7 Tesla machine, and that's very difficult to adjust. He has a machine in which the monkey can sit upright, which has been specially designed for him. And uh, I don't know if that, uh, those of you who are at neuroscience will know that he got very good results when the monkey was under, under an anesthetic, but they weren't, weren't so good when the monkey was alert because it was moving a little. And the small movements uh, make a lot of difference when you're, when you're working at high, high resolution. But he tells me now that they've trained the monkey, rather than restraining the monkey, they've trained the monkey to keep still and the results are good. And for those who are interested, the resolution is getting down, the fMRI resolution is getting down to about 200 mu, which is extremely good. So that's one type of experiment. Another type of experiment is the motion after effect. Remember the waterfall effect that we mentioned. This was originally done by Roger Tutel and colleagues, but it's been repeated recently by two other groups, uh, Sheng He and colleagues, and, 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 and Cullum and co colleagues. And they've used a slightly different thing. Remember I told you about the motion after effect. Uh, you, another thing you have to know about it is that the longer you do it, the longer you stay watching, the bigger the, bigger the effect. Now, there's another curious thing. Uh, suppose you, you show the, uh, something moving down, the waterfall, and instead of looking at the rocks at one side, as it were, you put, because all done with the screens, uh, uh, TV monitors, you show a blank screen for a time. Well, uh, surprisingly enough, if you then show, show something static, it moves upwards or whatever it may be in the opposite direction, even though there's that interval. And, um, uh, that's called, that's a, the w word for that is storage. And just to make life more difficult, it makes a difference whether the blank screen is completely black or whether it's gray. So there are technical differences of these things. But again, it does mean that, that, that they were able to study it in more detail. And it's fair to say they studied the ac activity largely in, 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 in MT, the motion area. They did get effects in other areas, by the way without going into that, what's well, probably the equivalent of V3A for those who are interested. Is, and by and large, the correlation was good. So this is a, a, a beginning of an example of how what you can do on humans with functional MRIs, showing what you might call visual illusions. But again, I'll be very much happier when that is then gone over and done the same visual illusions with fMRI in a monkey and then looked in electrodes. And that hasn't been done as yet. Now, there's one other ca case I'll mention because I don't want to go to, uh, there aren't that number of experiments, but I don't want to go through all of them. And that is doing fMRI scans. Actually, I think in this case it was a PET scan done by Semi Zekis and colleague in London when, uh, with a person who had damage to V1. This was actually the, mat, the, 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 the uh, patient who is extensively used in blind sight studies. Now, I, don't think, I, don't, I didn't think I said that if you make the signal, I did say that if you get up to a certain level of salience, the man, uh, uh, when forced to guess, guess well, guesses above, fairly well above chance. But it's equally true that if you make it more salient still, he does say that he perceives something which he finds difficult to describe. In other words, he does have some conscious response. The way he describes this is if you are looking at a bright light and you close your eyes and move your hand, you get the impression that something is moving. You see, what you have to ask is what is it like to see movement when you can't see the shape that's moving? Remember, we argued that different aspects of consciousness are happening in different parts of the brain. Well, apparently that corresponds roughly what he's doing. And so they did, a function, they did a PET scan on it and did, did find there was activity in, in, the, in what we would now, they call it V5, by the way, in England, in um, MT, but also in other areas like V3 and, 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 and Area 7. Now, it's well known 
uh, from monkey studies, I won't cite, cite the exact uh, authors, that uh, if you knock out V1 in a monkey, you do get responses at MT, and they come by some separate pathway. They're not, not as strong, so it's not too surprising. But it does make the point, which, which Seki is very strong on, that you do not need the first visual area for consciousness. You can have a conscious experience when that's knocked out. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to humans, there are, there are arguments as to whether a little bit of preserved tissues and things of that sort. So the matter is not, to, in monkeys, it's rather different. You can just uh, remove the whole of V1 and, and uh, show, show the behavior. Well, I hope, you, hope that's given you some idea First of all, of the possible classes of experiments, and secondly, of the small number of experiments which are actually being pursued. And of course, our hope is that more people will join in with this work and not uh, merely restrict it to functional uh, to brain scans, but also uh, do it with, with electrodes. Although, as we saw, what you may be wanting to see is groups of neurons firing, and you're not quite sure what the relevant groups are. I think we discussed that in the last lecture. Uh, it's unclear at the moment what, what it is exactly you want to look for. You're groping, essentially. All right, well, then let me come to, to the, um, the final part of the lecture, which is I, some ideas. I say some recent ideas, but I put them in brackets. Some of them are not all that recent. Let me, let me, let me start, off, start off with, because they're fairly miscellaneous. One of the questions you remember that Christoph and I originally decided not to tackle was what was the function of consciousness? But then uh, we decided perhaps we ought to think about that a little, and we have now got what we think is a very reasonable way of looking at it. The, the way we approach the matter, and I don't think this is actually novel, but we may have expressed it a little more clearly than other people. Uh, the way we, we, you could look at it is to say, well, why can't I just be a zombie? Why can't I d do everything in the, the way that we think you do when you reach and grasp for something, in which the conscious experience probably comes later, incidentally? Why can't you have a whole series of zombie systems? And their answer is, I think there's no difficulty in principle why you shouldn't have that. The frog has one system, for example, I don't know if I mentioned this before, the frog has one system in which if there's a small thing like a moving insect, it will flick out its tongue, and it has another system which if something looms, it jumps away. And these are two distinct systems in the brain. We don't know that it's unconscious, but we do know there are two distinct systems. So why can't you have a number of those? Well, I think the answer is that if you wanted to replicate human behavior, you'd have to have such an enormous number of distinct systems. And the point of consciousness, therefore, is, as it were, is to not deal with, with uh, situations which you, uh, not exactly like a reflex, but, but the, uh, the, the, the output is uh, more or less constrained by the nature of, of the input. What you want to do when you see something is has uh, the best up-to-date interpretation of what's coming into you in the light of your past experience and hold it for long enough that you can go into the thinking planning part of your brain and so on and act on it. And that we think is what consciousness is all about. Why it has to take the particular form it does is not clear, but it certainly has that character. In other words, uh, you can do innumerable things there's no doubt, you, as you're looking at me, you're thinking about different things and you're picking up a pencil and doing this. You can do innumerable things just from that visual and auditory input and all the rest of it. And that is what I think his consciousness is for. And that's why we think it has to be su sustained for a certain time. If you don't want that, you could do everything online. But you'd have to have so many distinct online systems that we, we think that, that uh, you'd be at a selective disadvantage. Anyway. Whether you like it or not, that's our present view of what we think conscious, uh, consciousness is for. Well, following on that, uh, Christoph Koch wondered essentially, therefore, uh, that we shouldn't think more about go going from the visual input to the thinking planning part of the brain and the motor output. And it's thought that, the, well, I won't go into a whole details of the motor system and the pre-motor system, but it's well known that you have damage to this part of the brain. Uh, we, a lot of your, your planning can go awry, especially if it's at the very front of the brain. So 
it's, it's, well, it's well believed that that's the, what the, we don't know what happens largely in the front of the, of the brain uh, of ourselves or of monkeys, but that's the general way of looking at it. Now, you remember I said that in general, when you go from one cortical area to another, you recode everything. You take the input, you look for the correlations into it, and you express it in a new form, which you then put onto the next stage. This is only a rough caricature of what's happening. The point is, you're recoding it. And therefore, we, we said that if you get an area of the visual cortex is going to uh, be, have uh, neurons firing, which represent part of the neural correlate of consciousness, they should project directly and not merely indirectly, where they be recoded, um, they should pre project directly to the front of the brain. And when we looked at the neuroanatomy, now it has to be admitted this is the neuroanatomy of the macaque, because I explained to you we can't do the neuroanatomy we'd like to do in humans. We do not find any pathway from V1 to the front of the brain. We do, of course, when you get up to IT, and certainly from some of those other areas that I mentioned. You do not find it, and for those of you interested, you know you get one to the basal ganglia and various other places. You do get a, a very weak one, the periphery to the brainstem, but forget about that. You do get an input to the thalamus, and it's possible you can get something that way. Now, um, I don't think I, I don't know whether I've got, the, she'll mention this later, I may not have time, but of course there are some things that may not be recoded. Uh, whether two things are the same or different, you can probably pass on from one to the next, but what they actually are. So we made the prediction that if you looked at what neurons far to in the first visual area, the one which David Hubel talked about so extensively, you would in general find that they were not the one, they didn't correspond to what you see. Now it doesn't mean to say that the V1 isn't important, I mean, your eyes are important, but very few people believe that actually what you're aware of corresponds in detail to what happens in your eyes. It has to be processed before you can see it, as I explained before. So this is the, the assumption we made for, 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 for V1. And I think this is shown, the sort of idea, in the next slide, which is about as sketchy a slide as you could make. So here is the retina. Here is the bit of the thalamus, the LGN. Here's the first visual area here. Here, lumped together, are all these higher cortical areas with multiple pathways going to the prefrontal and motor areas and then giving you to, to output. You can actually get, uh, uh, from pre-motor, you can get an output, but never mind about that. And somewhere we think in there is visual awareness. Notice all these big question marks. But what we're saying is there is no actual pathway that does this. That pathway is missing. Uh, that's the nature of it. Well, not everybody believes this, and, and Dan Pollan has written a long article saying why he thinks we're wrong, so it's certainly a controversial matter. But we do have a number of experiments, which I'm only going to describe one, which suggest it may be on the right lines. And the one I'm going to describe is done by uh, Sheng He and, and two colleagues, and I, for that I need the next slide. Now, essentially, uh, what, what, they do, what they do is they, first of all, they make a person fixate at this point here and they show a patch of orientation at some distance away in the visual field here. Now, what you find if you do that, you get people to stare at it, keeping the fixation constants and so on. There's a particular orientation. I can't see it on this slide, but let's suppose it's this orientation here like this. There's, there are lines in that patch you see, which are a particular orientation. And putting it crudely, it's not the right way of talking about it, but it's the way I'm going to talk about it. The, the system which is responding to that fatigues. So if then you, you do this when it's fairly bright. If then you t test how sensitive it is to that orientation, you find that it's lost sensitivity. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't go as, as well. And um, that, of course, is extremely, that type of thing is extremely well known. And it isn't, incidentally, fatigue. It's probably adaptation, but never mind. Um, OK, so now you do uh, another experiment in which uh, this is the real experiment. So then you look here, and you have all these patches here at an orientation, of which you have to attend to one. I think it's this one, this one here. 
Now, the remarkable thing is if you do that, under the conditions that they use, you can see the patch, but the effect of this surrounding ones here is what's called masking it, and you can't see the orientation. If you're asked to guess, you, you say, they say you can't see it, and you ask the guess, they guess at chance, you see. And they do that even if you leave it on for some time. It's not like one of these dreadful experiments when they flash it on for a fifth of a second and you really think you haven't seen anything at all. There's no doubt you're seeing a patch there, but you can't see the orientation. But if you then test after that, when you haven't seen the orientation, test whether the sensitivity has been altered by doing this subsequent test, it has. In other words, part of your brain knows that orientation has been shown and has adapted or fatigued to it, but you're not conscious of it. And for various reasons, it's suspected that this process must happen in, in the first visual area. I won't go into that. So that's the type of evidence, and as I say, it's suggestive, but not, not conclusive. Well, the next thing that, um, that Christopher and I began to, to wonder about is, shouldn't we pay a little more attention to what... Uh, Consciousness is like. Um, I, I told you at the beginning that everybody has a rough idea of what consciousness is. I didn't want to define it. But sooner or later, you begin to worry about it. And we knew of, of a book by Ray Jackendorf, which he'd published, it must be 10 years ago, ago now, uh, which he called the Intermediate Level Theory of Consciousness. That was the subtitle of the book. Let me try and get over in a word what was the nature of his idea because the people found it very odd, as he pointed out. It's not what you commonly think. What Jackendorf claims is that you are not directly conscious of your thoughts. What you are conscious, he claims, is a sensory representation of your thoughts, either in speech, unspoken speech, visual imagery, other things of that sort. And he arrived at this conclusion not by just um, sitting in the garden one summer day, but because he's a cognitive um, psychologist with a, with a deep knowledge of, of, la of, of linguistics and music, and uh, um, he also applied it to the visual system, as I'll say in a moment, and um, he, he argued for that. Now, you may find that a little strange, but let me give you an example. Um, those of you who, who are, uh, are bilingual, uh, can express a thought in two different languages, which you normally do. But as it were, the thought is there behind the, la the way you express it in the language. Another way of getting some gr grasp of the idea is, is, is a, a remark that I don't know who's supposed to have made it. How do I know what I think till I hear what I say? <laughs> well, uh, so we became very interested in this, and then somewhat to our surprise, we, we fa found that... Uh, that uh, uh, a philosopher psychologist in England, Stevens, had arrived at the same thing. We found it by a report of a meeting. We, of course, we've been in touch with him since, which he did it by pure introspection. He actually went intros introspected and uh, to came to the conclusion that all really think well, what we're talking about is what things that have qualia. Remember, it's the qualia we want to explain. Of course, it's important to explain thoughts, but what we want to explain is the qualia. And then, somewhat to our embarrassment, we found that, that a number of other people had said this before, including Freud. Now, now one, way, one way of looking at it is the following. What this says is that you're conscious that you have qualia for two different things. There's the outside world, which people going back as far as Kant at least has said you're not directly aware of, but you're aware of a representation of it. And then there's this inner world of thought, which according to this point of view you're not directly aware of, but only of a rep representation. And the third point is that those representations are both in sensory terms. And that, I think, is an attractive hypothesis, although I can see by the way you're all reacting that you're feeling a bit cool about it. <laughs> and indeed, there are, are tricky bits which we've, for example, about emotions, uh, tip of the tongue feelings, things of that sort. Uh, which Christopher and I have decided uh, we'll leave on one side for the moment, although there are people who think that emotions really are more or less of that character. Well, um, that's all very well, but as, as you heard from the introduction, naturally we wanted to know how you would actually test it. Now, people who theorize about vision, certainly David Marr and other people as well, 
have, have said that it goes through a series of stages in which they're correct. When you, you, ha you have to, you can't see things straight away. As we said, there has to be a visual hierarchy and you have to process things. And one of the stages that David Marr just used his terminology was what's called the two and a half D sketch, which meant essentially that you're aware, it's another way of putting it is that it's viewer centered. That, that if I look at Nick here, it's viewer centered what I see that I have the qualia about and so on. And that's called the two and a half D sketch as opposed to the three D model which they also thought would be there, which is the actual three, the whole representation of, of, his, of his head, and, and so on. And the one way of doing it is, that, say, is the following, that if I look at Nick, um, of course I can imagine what the back of his head is like, because I have a representation of the, in, as it were, of the view invariant one, but what I'm conscious of is the front, and the next slide shows you what it would look like if he turned around and there was a face at the back. <laughs> you see, and you would be surprised, which shows that you, you weren't expecting that. That's a, a, a takeoff by a, of a thing by a well-known artist, by the way. Um, so we asked ourselves the question, uh, what about, in particular, faces and views of the head? Now, it's been well known, especially from the work of, of, of Perrette, and to some extent, well, and, and, and Nicholas Lagavigas and Rolls, for that matter, but particularly Perrette, that, that you do find neurons which respond to the front view of the face, and you can find other ones which respond to this view, and this view, and some which respond to this view, and so on. And that's called viewer-centered. And um, what people think nowadays is that the main, re main mechanism used for seeing things is, if I may use a different terminology, it's a lookup table of different views in which you interpolate. Of course, it's not as crude as that, but that's the, bas the basic idea. So we asked, uh, well, if you look at, at these neurons, and this, we were able to look at the results of, of those three people I, groups I just mentioned, uh, do you find neurons which respond to all the way round? Well, most of the work has been done in this infratemporal area. We still don't have much in other areas. And the answer is the great majority of neurons respond to be viewer-centered. They correspond to qualia. Now, there is a small percentage, Rolls actually finds a slightly higher percentage, which do respond all the way around. Now, this is one of the things you get from neural networks. You know that if you have neural networks, they don't do necessarily a clean job, and you could argue this small percentage was just an accidental representation. But uh, Perret had some uh, six cases, and a very small number, and therefore he mentioned it, but he wouldn't put much weight on it, in which he mentioned what's called the latency how long it took for the signal to arise. That's difficult to measure and so on. But the conclusion was it took an extra 10 or 15 milliseconds to see all around view. See, rather than therefore being uh, something that is happening within one particular type of neuron, it looks as if, if the, the viewer-centered one were one type of neuron and, and the viewer invariant one was another one. Naturally, we're very interested to know what happens when you look at face neurons in the front of the brain, whereas where you, we think you're, as it were, there's more of your thoughts there. I better be careful how I express it. There's more of your thoughts there, but the people who have looked there haven't looked as it were all the way round, and we're, we're hoping that will be, will be done before long. So um, I'd, I'd like to leave you with this um, attractive hypothesis. I think Jack and Giff should get the major cred credit, even though Stevens and Freud and other people had mentioned it, because he developed it uh, most clearly, that you are not directly conscious of your thoughts. And it's nice after all have a hypothesis which, which uh, seems to, uh, to be, a at first sight, to be a contradiction in terms. At least I find it more stimulating. Um, now, I don't think I have too much more to say, except a little bit about what is the actual nature of, of the, uh, what we started with, of those possibilities of um, what is the, ne the neural correlate. And uh, one idea which has been developed by Abelais in Israel is what is called synfire chains. That you have a group of neurons which fire together, which then activate another group of neurons which fire, and another one, and may come back in a loop. And as I understand is a recent, recent paper by Edelman and a colleague, which is a, talks about complexity in the nervous system, which I won't deal with, is along those lines. Now, I think that's probably a very attractive idea. The difficulty is, at the moment, is we do not have the tools 
to actually define what the groups are, especially as the groups uh, will be changing all the time. So we have to realize that, that whatever the NCC is, is not necessarily going to be simple. It may involve certain types of neurons, but the way they interact and talk to each other may be rather complex. And uh, this, this is why we're still, as it were, uh, groping. Now there's one uh, final point that I'd like to make, um, and that is, it's almost a philosophical one. I've said that you're not conscious of something unless there's what I call an explicit representation. Unless there's a group of similar neurons, or maybe several groups, but at least one group, which are firing to that property, that you won't see a face unless there are face neurons, putting it crudely. But you, therefore, you mustn't use the argument, isn't it peculiar, that we, the brain doesn't see some difference? There are arguments as to the time of arrival in consciousness, for example. Semizeki um, claim, claims that to, uh, color arrives into consciousness uh, um, some 50 or 80 milliseconds before motion and things of that sort. And, and you can show that this, you can make, do experiments suggesting that may be true, although they're slightly controversial, uh, and so on. But uh, you're not actually aware of it. So it's not enough to assume that you're a little homunculus and because something goes on in your brain, you're aware of it. You won't be aware of it unless you have an explicit representation. And some of the things, as it were, in conscious will depend on not having an explicit representation. So let me try and give a, a general picture of where things are, uh, they are. It looks as if visual, the visual NCC, or the, the part that involves the content of it, involves various areas in the vent ventral stream and their interaction with other parts, probably front prefrontal cortex, and also uh, probably parietal. Now, ex the exact nature of the interaction between these three classes of areas, the prefrontal, the, per the, the, the bits of the dorsal stream, and bits of the ventral stream, uh, of course, is very much an open question. It may be that, it, that all you need but this part of the brain, for example, is to provide an attentional mechanism and the essential interaction is between the visual system and prefrontal. But there are others who think that a more complicated interaction is needed and we really don't know at this stage. We, we certainly suspect that various loops, such as the ones I just mentioned, and also one which I haven't mentioned, which is the loops between the, the uh, cortex and the thalamus may be involved. Uh, and all those essentially uh, show that how little we actually know. But that isn't what I want to lead, <laughs> the, the, how I want to end up to leave you the impression. The, the, point I want, the points I want to make are the following, which I, you will have noticed from the talk. The experiments are now beginning to look for the NCC. It's not just a matter of people discussing it ad nauseam and producing lots of ideas. There are actually experiments being designed, and there are lots more, as like you can see from that summary of possible ones, which could be designed. Even though our ideas about the NCC are too vague and too confused, at least we can start nibbling at the problem by doing the experiments. And for that, we shall probably need new methods. If you ask, we, we, Christoph and I are constantly wanting to know things and then realizing that we do not simply have the methods to answer the questions. Because we don't know we're asking the right questions, but at least we can see that if they are the right questions, we don't have the methods. And some of those will be based um, on molecular biology, as I said in the last thing. And that will make much more type powerful tools. Now, once we have a clearer idea of what we want to look for, then I hope we'll be able to go to focus experiments on simpler systems, because then they could be more rapidly and more and cheaper. But it's very difficult to do that when you don't know what you're, you're looking for. And finally, I should say, it's not enough to explain a little bit of visual consciousness. We've got to explain all aspects of visual consciousness and all aspects of other forms of consciousness, including the ones I mentioned, like emotion and so on. But what we don't know and I hope at least some of you will li 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 uh, live to see the answer, is if we knew all that, if we did have a good theory, if we did have a lot of facts and so on, if it was really solidly established, would that answer Chalmers' hard question? How you go from the NCC to what you perceive? And there I think we have to say we have to keep an open mind. So uh, with those, th those thoughts, I think I'll finish. Thank you.